Well, welcome everyone uh, to Red Square, Austin DSA. Uh, really honored to be with you all today. Uh, Mike Siegel, I am the political director of Ground Game Texas and a, a proud member of Austin DSA. And I'm here with Mike Lewis uh, from Austin DSA and Michael Brennan from Metro DC DSA. And uh, we're just hoping to start a conversation here about public banking as a, a socialist tactic, as a demand that we can make here in Austin as something that uh, could be a part of a broader program. And uh, just also to introduce this broader concept of um, finance, progressive finance, democratic finance. And, um, you know, I am here kind of as a broker of the conversation. I don't claim to be an expert in any of this stuff. Um, and so I'll give a little background how we got here. Um, basically, uh, my friend Mike Lewis, who's here, is kind of a wonk. He's interested in, in these, these progressive finance ideas. Uh, he's uh, collaborated with uh, Andres Bernal, who's a progressive econ guy on, on some papers. Um, so he talks to me about this stuff. But when uh, the mayor of Austin and Austin City Council during South by Southwest announced that they were going to uh, pass multiple resolutions supporting crypto and blockchain in the city of Austin, and it was this real rah-rah moment for crypto and they were even proposing that people should be able to get paid in crypto and pay their water bills in crypto and get their retirement in crypto. Um, we knew it was a time to push back and um, maybe do some public education. And uh, it's in the process, we developed a, an op-ed for the Austin Chronicle that they ran uh, that Mike Lewis has posted in the chat, which was kind of like, Austin can do better than crypto. And it was laying out some of the, the core arguments about um, how crypto and blockchain are actually really damaging uh, tools uh, or technologies, industries. But also our goal was to kind of use that moment um, to uh, kind of do a little judo or, or jujitsu, basically to use the momentum that was created by these um, crypto lobbyists who convinced the mayor and the council to take action and to basically like uh, talk to these folks and convince them, hey, uh, we need to explore financing in the state of Texas when we are, are under uh, massive revenue constraints, when there's, um, you know, th these uh, state caps on, on taxation, uh, there's all these uh, blocks on ways to generate revenue, we don't have a state income tax, um, you know, we do need to figure out ways to fund our social programs, but crypto is not the way, blockchain is not the way. Um, and so it was on March 24th that all this went down to the city council. And ultimately we got multiple city council members to basically water down the pro crypto stuff in these different resolutions. And then to also, cause what ended up happening is like, it was uh, two resolutions that essentially gave the city manager some authority to study and support these different ideas, uh, but nothing specific. And so we also got them to say, uh, we'll, we'll support public banking, we'll support uh, complementary currencies uh, and alternatives to cryptocurrency. So, Technically, right now, the city of Austin has a policy that could be used to support public banking, especially if there was a campaign that, that gave that momentum, uh, and especially if there were city council members or a mayor who wanted to do something with it. Um, so that was kind of the genesis of how we got here. Um, Mike Lewis, do you want to chime in at all on the overview? Yeah, sure. No, that's that's a great uh, lead in. And, and basically, you know, um, working with like Michael Brennan, who helped us out as well, just, just trying to define different ways in those resolutions to make interventions for, you know, basically more more democratic and, and, and uh, public control over, um, you know, this this uh, area of technology, you know, um, you know, even even looking at, you know, the areas of, of Kind of like these crypto organizations, like the, the, um, distributed autonomous organizations, they're called DAOs, and, and finding you know finding ways in the language to, to basically say you know the city can only support this if it's uh, open source and cooperative and democratic and privacy preserving and nonprofit and socially oriented. So like basically looking for all the kinds of ways in the resolution to kind of push back um, on some of the industry talking points. Um, you know, we were able to uh, make sure that there's a bit more skepticism around the known power consumption challenges with uh, blockchain technologies, which, you know, like proof of work um, systems, they're kind of uh, intentionally uh, inefficient, running a lot of calculations. The whole idea behind kind of crypto, there's a lot of libertarian ethos throughout, um, you know, just the idea that you can turn over 
uh, finance and banking to a line of code, essentially this, you know, uh, code is law idea. Um, it's this kind of like disintermediation, this, this uh, distrust in, in uh, governance and people that makes it kind of inherently right wing. And so unless there's some kind of public regulation, you know, most of the crypto industry is basically unregulated securities that operate kind of in a world of shadow banking. So basically uh, uh, organizations, uh, companies performing the roles of banks um, without any kind of uh, actual charter or legal uh, uh, regulation around what they're doing. So like we've seen this over hundreds of years of finance history where, you know, you know in the 1800s, there was a lot of bank runs for these private outfits that issued, uh, you know, private money and, and it was unregulated and extremely volatile. And it was, you know, very much so a poverty trap for working class people. And so, you know, the whole idea is how can we make sure that we can democratize finance to make sure that it works for uh, working people. Um, and so, you know, that's what kind of leads us into this conversation. I'll pass it over to Michael from here. Right on. Yeah, Michael. Um, I mean, this isn't a presentation about crypto, but um, if you could kind of, if you want to make an opening comment about like, you know, <laughs> Why not crypto and, and maybe help us transition into the public banking conversation? Sure. I mean, the, the thing that was really helpful for me or very clarifying from this background that you're presenting um, when we were doing it was um, I hadn't really considered as much the binary that could be set up or the clarifying nature of like there's public money and private money. And like crypto is really the leading edge of like um, a private money movement and where that's going. And I think we have to understand what our alternative is and what our policy prescriptions and our movements around public money are gonna look like. And I feel like um, the emergence at the state and local level of different cryptocurrency lobbies that are going to be pushing for, you know, tax receivability of cryptocurrencies, um, different like public support for like public subsidies for, you know, innovation and kind of tech hubs, like the things that we've kind of seen previously in terms of, um, ways that cities will try to incentivize uh, companies like Amazon to come to where they're at. Um, I, I think it's it's gonna be more and more in the future. And this was, um, it was an interesting development to kind of put them next to each other in this way that I hadn't seen before. So um, I think it, it makes sense that we would kind of end up talking about crypto alongside um, public banking with when we're focusing on the, on the local level. Sure. Right on. And um, let's see. There we go. That's a little better. Um, I mean, you know, the real thrust of our op-ed was from an equity point of view, uh, crypto is helping the first adopters, right? If you bought Bitcoin when it started, what, what your goal is, is to get poor people to buy crypto now. Uh, and then you get out while it's at its peak. Uh, it's interesting, like since, since that whole fight we had three months ago, crypto has dropped a lot. Um, and so in some ways, our, some of our arguments have been prescient. But um, anyway, long story short, uh, we want to talk about public banking and uh, and and de develop demands for for public finance and, and public money, as Michael said. And so uh, I'm going to try to get out of the way here. I'm going to introduce each slide and then pass it to the experts. Um, so what's our our status quo? Uh, the city budget is de dependent on so-called taxpayers, and and um, some of our co-hosts can talk more about this idea of taxpayers by itself is like an extremely racist, you know, Jim Crow concept, right? It, it's like it's code for for white people's property. Um, but, you know, the city budgets depend on private investment um, and revenue caps obviously prevent our ability to raise uh, new resources. There's the whole recapture for school funding that prevents us from adequately funding public education uh, in, in Austin, in, in a property rich city. And in, in relation to banking, um, our money, our public dollars are sitting in private bank accounts controlled by J.P. Morgan Chase. And so instead of... Um, you know, our money being used to leverage investments for public good, uh, they're sitting in JP Morgan Chase accounts. And then their JP Morgan is then investing in predatory and exploitative uh, industries, fossil fuels, extraction, private prisons, financial speculation. Um, and so uh, Mike uh, Lewis, you wanna add to this slide here? Actually, I was gonna pass it over to Michael since uh, we, we used his uh, a graphic from his governance paper. Yeah, I mean, you know, just in terms of the status quo, I, I felt like the, I mean, the COVID episode is pretty much the, help clarify a lot of like the way that we're dependent on a private financial infrastructure for dealing with crises and dealing with things as they come up, right? So 
um, when you know COVID hit and we were one of the big issues in 2020 was around um, getting federal aid to the state and local governments. And absent that, um, you know, we were kind of structurally dependent on being able to borrow um, on the municipal bond market and, um, you know, depleted tax revenue at the state and local level um, when we're in this public health emergency, which is when we should be spending the most amount of money, right? And so it, it puts us in a bind that um, kind of, it, it demonstrates the inadequacies of the current system. I think people were maybe more tuned into it then as they, than they might feel now. I think we're kind of in a different moment and I don't know how much those lessons were really learned, but um, to me, I, I think that's a helpful starting place though when trying to kind of, um, you know, think about where we are and, and how we got here. Um, and, you know, there's the long history of um, uh, how we became, our city, the American cities became dependent on um, you know, segregated housing and property taxes, um, municipal bond markets and how they developed since the New Deal and like how the banking reforms helped structure that. Um, and that's leading to today. And like, what do we want to do about it is kind of, you know, where, where we might want to lead into some of our policies, but um, riffing a bit, but that, that's kind of my Yeah, thing. like the, like property taxes were, uh, pro using property taxes to fund public education was a tool of racial segregation, you know, from the start. And just like, so this, just like you mentioned, Mike, on this whole taxpayer revenue model, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, cities, local governments are funded by the taxpayer is, is very much a dog whistle. It's rooted in, you know, the, the racist uh, backlash to reconstruction. Um, you know, check out Vanessa Williamson in Descent Magazine or a, a historian Camille Walsh on this. Um, but yeah, and then so 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 where cities are today is you know everything is viewed through, the, through this you know either taxes or it's you know uh, a bond that they're they're getting uh, through the 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 private market. Um, even though uh, we know that the Fed can be the the buyer of, of uh, bonds uh, at first or last resort, um, we know that you know whether or not cities go bankrupt is very much a policy choice. Um, you know, at the at the federal level, those the, the Fed could back up cities if we wanted to. And many of the famous bankruptcies of cities throughout uh, the decades, um, you know, uh, the New York uh, City crisis in the mid 70s, um, Detroit, there's other cities that have gone through major issues. Um, a lot of these kind of decisions on whether or not a city goes bankrupt is very much a policy choice. I know. Well, um, so in 21, 22, um, uh, this is just, a, I guess, a slide about our budget, right? Um, and, you know, the note from the city manager is describing how um, the biggest challenge for, for funding city programs and resources is the state imposed revenue cap of, you know, we can basically raise our property tax three and a half percent per year. And um, you, the only way to go around that is to require a, a tax rate election. And so this has like become a, uh, an acronym that they use at City Hall now, a TRE. Um, it's the only way you could theoretically raise um, uh, taxes more than three and a half percent. And so for any of you who are following the current budget fights about the next fiscal year, where you know we successfully advocated for a resolution for 22 an hour as the, the minimum pay for city workers, for example. But uh, what's happening right now in the city of Austin is we can't keep staff uh, at, in any department you know, from lifeguards all the way up to lawyers and everyone in between. There's massive attrition, uh, unfilled positions, we can't fund that. Uh, we can't fund our basic needs like housing. Um, you know, uh, we, we can't fund uh, climate action. You know, we can't close this coal plant uh, that's owned by the city of Austin in Fayette County. Um, all these ridiculous constraints, even though uh, anyone who is in Austin, walks around Austin, sees how immensely wealthy this community is. Uh, so this is just, uh, the, you know, the context right now um, that every year from here on out, uh, we have state imposed austerity coming down the pike and it's going to get worse and worse. And we're in this political pickle where you have to go to the, the, the voters to get a tax increase. And of course, that, uh, you know, empowers the most conservative elements of our community. Oh, you know, we can't raise taxes for bop, bop, bop reason. Um, it's going to hurt. I mean, they'll, they'll make any argument, but what that's going to mean is they're going to continue to starve the government. 
And we're going to continue to have these conflicts about, you know, can we cut police resources? Can we, can we raise money for housing and, and, and wages and the rest? Um, any, any of y'all want to comment on kind of the context here? Okay. Oh, okay, I'll keep going here. Um, so here's, a, here's to our current banker, JP Morgan Chase. And so right now, uh, they're holding four and a half billion dollars. Um, well, actually, the city of Austin manages more than four and a half billion dollars in annual revenues uh, collected through taxes, fees, and fines. And we have bank accounts, uh, including 1.7 billion in cash, as well as uh, billions in investments in our city pension funds. And so this is um, held at J.P. Morgan Chase, and uh, we get almost zero interest on that. Additional comments? Yeah, and like, you know, I think where a lot of the infrastructure around understanding a lot of this stuff is like, shout out to the folks who are involved in the divestment movements. Um, you know, we, we kind of came to understand J.P. Morgan Chase is Austin's banker through folks that, you know, were protesting the Fayette Coal Plant and were protesting the city of Austin to, you know, divest from fossil fuels, which, and it was like Keystone XL and other various flashpoints over the years. Um, where, where a lot of the infrastructure for public banking across the country has come from. Yeah, it's worth saying, even just in the point earlier about, um, you know, maybe public banks or public money versus crypto, um, the California movement for public banks uh, largely came out of um, kind of the grassroots solidarity divestment movements for, um, from the private banks, which they successfully did in Los Angeles, I think it's Sacramento, um, there's, there's other cities, I'm, I'm not at the top of my head, but, um, there were, there was a network of cities that were doing this in 2016 and 2017. And then that's what created the groundwork for what became the California public banking Alliance, which successfully passed state law in 2019 to allow for state public banks. So there's a direct connection there between, um, you know, uh, environmental activism or the solidarity of Standing Rock and, um, the divestment movement into public banks and what our alternative is. Sure. And as we get into it, I think it's worth pointing out, like, what does a bank do, right? So they take in money for deposits. Um, they hold a certain amount in reserves. Um, they, they create loans um, through their chartering power, through the Fed. They have a banking charter that allows them kind of quasi-currency issuing capabilities where, you know, they can create a loan on a balance sheet, basically. Um, and so, you know, they issue those out uh, they make money off of those. Uh, so kind of just a very basic level, make sure we kind of clarify some, some kind of one-on-one one -on -one stuff here too. I mean, this slide also shows our enemy, right? Um, like this, JP Morgan, it's not just Austin, you know, they hold the money for a lot of municipalities. Uh, I understand that they're one of the, you know, that's one of their biggest businesses is they hold municipal money. And so obviously they're gonna fight us. And some people have asked about this movement. Well, if we get a public bank in Austin, isn't the state legislature just gonna you know, preempt us or overrule us? And, and definitely that's, that's one of the threats to this movement is, is private finance. Um, not wanting us to hold our own money, right? Not wanting us to make interest and make loans. Um, one of the things we're gonna talk about is in Philadelphia where there's been a, some major progress on public banking. That movement came out of the racial justice movement um, because uh, banks were obviously redlining uh, denying loans to black businesses in Philadelphia. And so it was a city councilman in Philadelphia that really carried a lot of the water uh, to make progress on public banking there. Because because if you control your money, then you can give loans to the people you want, uh, to the small businesses you want, um, you know, to home buyers, to, you know, anyways. So it, 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 it's a huge point of leverage. And obviously uh, there'll be some major enemies if this movement advances. So what can a public bank do? Um, Michael, you want to kind of run this down for us? Sure. Um, I think it's helpful to start when you're talking about public banking and public finance with like for what purpose and for whom. I think like, yeah, a lot of the money stuff, public finance stuff gets very technocratic very quickly and gets very like far away from people's lives. And I think you should always start with like, what are the problems we're trying to solve? So like we've kind of identified like, um, you know, housing, education, um, like green economy, like environmental uh, issues, um, jobs for people, like those are the things that we want our banks to do for our communities. And like, that's like uh, important to start with both on like a just educational level, like how we're thinking about it, but also on like a legal level. 
um, because when you actually set up the bank, like the way that that language is designed is going to be enshrined into law. And so the language we're using to start, like, is going to inform how these things develop up until the point where we're actually writing policy and actually creating these institutions. So um, it's important to start with why are we doing this and for whom are we doing this for? And I think as socialists, like, we're thinking of, you know, tenants, we're thinking of workers, we're thinking of folks who are generally dispossessed and, like, that's why we want public banks. So starting there. Um, but, you know, a bank is, there, there's basically two main ways we can think about the functions of what we'd want it to do. The first is its role as a lender. Um, so who is it lending to and why? Um, it can create loans um, for, you know, cooperative businesses. It can create loans for affordable housing. Um, it can create loans for, um, you know, uh there's a range of things i could go through um the other side of it would be the role of banks as um uh like retail banking or like consumer banking so you know you have your bank account at a bank right now um and um there's a way way is that like by setting up a public bank and having that as an infrastructure that people can utilize it can create a more inclusive banking environment right now we have um um, a two-tier banking system, essentially, where there's folks who can have access to a bank account, and there's folks who where it, there's either banking deserts, there's not like a bank branch around them, there's not ATMs, and they're reliant on like payday lenders, they're reliant on cash checking services and ways that they act, they don't actually have a bank account or like undocumented folks as well, I'm sure struggle in some ways with being legally recognized within the system, um, where people get money extracted from them, and it puts them in vulnerable positions. And so, having a retail bank side of your public bank will be important for um, making sure, you know, and again, this is, has to be kind of designed into it. And like, it's important that people are paying attention when we're setting up these public banks that we're, we're making them inclusive to folks and they're actually preserving people's privacy and that they're um, for folks on the most on the margins that these are things that they're able to access. So I would start there in terms of um, setting up what the bank can do. Right on. So, um, you know, that we've started a brainstorm of who could benefit from public banking. Um, uh, Mike Lewis, you want to kind of run down this list, what you're thinking? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So just kind of like riffing on what, what Michael was talking about in terms of, the, you know, who this was for, um, you know, kind of putting up front working families, um, labor, you know, where, where that can apply, apply is, is how the, the bank can create, uh, you know, loans for public purpose around maybe, you know, uh, a jobs program or something like that for the municipality, um, something that is an investment that would create jobs, um, you know, that, that can provide better financing than what would be available to the city from, you know, a private bank, for instance. Um, and so, you know, and then on down the line, you know, for the, for the both retail side as well as the loan side for uh, affordable and social housing, um, you know, small businesses, that was a key area for the movement in Philadelphia was um, getting the, the black community on board, especially when it came to, um, uh, you know, folks who were trying to start, start uh, small businesses that had been historically denied access to credit. Um, you know, looking at all the different areas that we're, where we can expand the, the municipality or the city's um, fiscal capacity um, as we're kind of looking at this divest and invest campaign for police reform. Um, that's another key area when we're looking at how, you know, how much fiscal capacity does the city of Austin have? Um, environmental, I would, I would point folks to how that's a kind of a key part of uh, Michael's governance proposal for LA is just like how you can make that a part of the plan to make sure that you're, you're putting it into green investment. Um, and then also who, who's going to be on the board of governance um, for the public bank as well, you know, getting members of the community from these various, you know, uh, various stakeholders um, as a part of the governance of the bank is also a part of it as well. Maybe Michael can talk about that. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's more slides, we can, we can get there. But sure. I want to, maybe a, a helpful way to think about this as well is like, you know, we're talking about for what and for whom as one side of it, like what is the bank doing? And then there's how do we, the governance is kind of the other piece of it, right? So like there's- Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. You wanna think in terms of like function and form, like there's 
functions are what it's doing and form is like how we're structuring it to be able to do those things. Um, so if we, yeah, we could explain it now, but also like I want to get the flow of this right. Sure, yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, I think a lot of people's questions is like, how do we do this? Um, and uh, can we do this? And our preliminary research is that uh, in Texas, this is legal right now. There's no ban on, on public banking. There's no preemption right now. Um, and so um, we, we kind of think of this as a longer term project. So right, right now we have to fight for survival. We have to get people abortions. Uh, we have to stop shootings in schools. Like, you know, there's like obviously a lot of immediate demands right now. We need to uh, adjust this budget in, in Austin. Uh, but this is something that theoretically could be uh, something we, we kind of push forward on the side and, and start a multi-year process to, to navigating the steps. Um, and so, um, you know, Mike Lewis has kind of got these slides together. You know, ideally you have someone on the inside who's helping move this along. Like we actually have knock down the first domino, however small. Like right now, uh, a city council member in Austin could start working with staff, you know, city manager staff to start developing this, like because there's a resolution on file that says the manager shall support, right? Um, you know, there's ideally you have like multiple community organizations that are on the outside that are pushing uh, city staff and, and, you know, the electeds to do something. And, you know, it could be DSA, uh, Texas Appleseed has uh, a progressive finance program. Um, you know, Austin Interfaith is interested in this. You know, that, that's one of the questions is like, what would be the coalition that would actually care about this and want to work on it over a long term? Um, obviously, a part of this has to be uh, political pressure, but part of this has to be public education, because this is like an issue that 99.9% .9 of people like, what? Public bank? You know, what does that mean? Um, I mean, one of the questions in the chat is, uh, is this similar to a savings and loan? And maybe Michael, uh, you can answer that question. Um, but obviously you need to do tons of public education to lay the foundation for a campaign like this. And um, then there's intermediate steps. And this is where, you know, really Philly DSA uh, had a huge role in, in the public banking campaign there. And it's an ongoing campaign. But basically before you get a fully chartered bank that can do everything that a bank can do, uh, there are these intermediate steps, uh, including a Philly uh, or a public financial authority. And uh, there, there's other models, analogous mo models for, for housing and economic development. So this is not like a unheard of concept. But um, I guess would either of you like to kind of clarify a little more the, the steps, how to get there? Yeah, I guess I can just jump in real fast. I had a conversation with Stan Shapiro who helped kind of co-run the, the Philly Public Bank Coalition. He he um he said that it was it was actually uh, not that many volunteers that they had that you know to kind of get this through. Um, it was kind of one very very uh, passionate city council member, Derek Green, um, and he kind of uh, moved it forward. There was some some grassroots um, uh, folks on the ground who were were volunteers, and that combination was what what got the fifteen to one uh, resolution passed in March which basically creates the uh, Philly Public Financial Authority. And it, it makes Philly the, the first city in the US uh, to be on its way to creating a public bank uh, at the city level. And you know, I think that uh, there was opposition from some of the, you know, the financial officers at the city level. Um, there was opposition from the mayor who didn't sign it into law and basically uh, you know, is kind of slow rolling implementation. Um, but yeah, there's, there's uh, kind of, I think the main thing to point out is that even with preemption as, as kind of like one of these looming uh, things that we're thinking about um, is that there are intermediate steps that can be won along the way. And then what, what does the Philly Public Financial Authority do? So it can basically create letters of credit, which can extend more loans to, you know, folks that have been historically underserved in that area, you know, poor folks, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the black community of Philadelphia, uh, maybe, maybe uh, Michael, you can talk more about, you know, kind of what, what they've won so far and what they have left to do. Yeah, I mean, the, the general goal is, um, in terms of the, we're talking about the, the steps here is like, if you set up an institution like this public financial authority, which is not a bank, um, you're creating like, you know, you need to get a building, you need to hire staff, you need to start building the actual institutional knowledge to be able to run or to publicly run this kind of financial institution. So 
if you take that first step before you even get the bank charter, which is kind of that that last mile, um, which is like a big legal and policy question, is how you get the bank charter. Um, you're already you're well positioned to get the ball rolling. So it's an interesting way to approach it, and it's kind of like you know people debate whether this is the right move. I think there'll be it'll be interesting to see how it goes um, because you know if you rely on letters of credit as your main you know, financing mechanism that you're you're going about achieving your mandate or achieving your mission as a bank or as a as a, as a financial authority, um, then um, you know you're essentially underwriting like other other financial institutions. So that might be private banks in Philadelphia. It might be um, you know community uh, financial development institutions, CD, CD, or CDFIs, community development financial institutions, things that are privately run or nonprofits. But you're essentially underwriting that private or nonprofit sector with the public authority. So you are invest like you are making that trade-off in terms of you know we're socialists think about political economy, what's developing over time, like how are they relying on that? And the um how how are you underwriting that so that they're actually able to just still profit off of this? Um, it might not be getting at the root of some of like the things you might want to address with our public banking or democratizing finance. Um, just being clear-eyed about it. I don't think that's to say they shouldn't do it, but like I think that's going to be a dynamic with how it goes forward. And then when they do try to get the bank charter, like how does that political influence of the banks and the CDFIs once they do start getting letters of credit from this PFA, um, like how does that influence the actual development of the bank into the future? Right. So there'll be interesting data, or interesting research we could do about. Um, really even just the politics of, of the Philly example. But that's just to say that, um, you know, as these things are popping off in California and Philly, Massachusetts, um, New York, elsewhere, um, there'll be different dynamics at play in terms of the steps that people took to get there and the coalitions that came together to do it. And it's worth understanding, like, why and how they did come together and how that influenced the eventual design of the actual bank that they won. Um, because there, it's going to be different and there's lessons to learn about better and worse ways that we can do it, which is kind of the focus of the paper that I dropped in the chat. But just to make it a little complicated, nuance it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And there's kind of like some sneaky ways to also kind of do a public bank without a public bank as well. So what I mean by that is essentially, you know, um, you could you could take existing public infrastructure, public payment platforms, uh, like a payment card, like a Metro card, um, you know, for for public transit. And you can make that, you know, into basically a, a debit card that can be used for uh, small businesses around public transit, um, for you know, any goods and services. So a really good example is like Hong Kong. They have what's called the Octopus card there. Octopus, um, you show up at the airport, you, you put some money onto an Octopus card, you can use it for any public transit, and you can also use it for most of the local small businesses there uh, for any kind of uh, basic needs and things like that. And so it acts as, a, as kind of this uh, one-stop shop and you know people put money on there and then you know it becomes like a store of value that you can use to leverage for uh, financing as well. So even if you can't get to a public bank, there's some other other ways that you can get there. Um, you know, Starbucks, for instance, at any given time, Starbucks has 1.6, 1.75 billion dollars sitting on Starbucks gift cards, and it's money that people put onto those gift cards. It's receivable in coffee, and there's no real you know interest. It's just very very cheap financing for for Starbucks. So you can take that same kind of uh, um, idea and apply it to, like I said, the Metro card. You can link it up with the local student card. I think UT is already doing this with uh, Bevo Bucks. They've had that for a long time with uh, Bevo Pay. It's usable at like 75 businesses around UT. And so, you know, UT can leverage the financing off of that, that pay card, um, you know, for financing as well. And there's another one, Mike, we haven't discussed before, which is um, right now Austin has a, a way to pay your parking um, where you have a little app, you know, I think it's yeah. called ATX Park, and you have to preload the money. So like they're sitting on $7 of mine because I had to preload 10 for my $3 parking. And so, I mean, I guess, I guess the city's privatized that little service, right? So theoretically, that could be, we could take that back into the public domain. Um, all right, well, so this is our um, our favorite uh, 
you know, test case, successful case. Uh, and it's this really strange thing once you first learn about it, like there's like a socialist, there was a socialist movement in North Dakota. They created a statewide uh, public bank and um, it's been around for a hundred years. And for example, during the, the pandemic, uh, when they were giving out these PPP loans to small businesses, uh, the North Dakota bank was able to get more money for, for North Dakotans and, and their small businesses than any other bank. And um, so like the idea, the idea that there can be a successful public bank that endures over time and then is able to uh, better support public needs, there's like this very great uh, test case. And so I don't know if either y'all wanna kind of preach about uh, North Dakota bank. I'll say from the historical standpoint, there was a bunch of bank runs and bank busts, uh, kind of like the ones we talked about at the beginning of the conversation with you know, kind of the private money and, and uh, uh, unregulated wildcat banking that was going on. And so that was hurting poor people, it left, left working families with a bag uh, while these outfits look for bailouts from the federal government. But so this movement kicked off. Uh, the same one that kind of led to a lot of the major establishment of, of federal banking laws was also, uh, you know, created this uh, movement of socialists between 1907 and 1919 was when they finally got the bank established. So you can think about that it was like a 12 year project for them. Um, and so, yeah, it's endured. It's, you know, it's a Republican run state now. Uh, and it still has the socialist institution and 7 billion under management is what I understand. I think Michael probably has some more uh info you can share yeah it's it's an interesting touch point for the public banking movement because it's the only active public bank in the united states it's been around for 100 years and it does have this kind of like bipartisan flavor to it um i'm trying to look up the current north dakota senator um i forget his name but he used to be the president of the bank of north dakota um i think it's john hoven yeah um which is just kind of a funny <laughs> a funny thing but um and it, it's kind of complicated too i mean I, I don't mean to you know like introduce all this at once in a, in a weird way but like um they like what i was saying before around um you know when you set up this the phillies public finance authority they're going to be lending essentially underwriting um private finance in philadelphia and this bank is designed as essentially a public-private partnership bank. Um, they don't give any loans directly to lenders. They work with um, banks in the state of North Dakota to do mortgages, agricultural loans, student loans, and small business loans. Um, and so they have more banks per capita in any state in the country because they've had this underwriting system, right, of the Bank of North Dakota. Um, but, um, you know, what does that entail for the development of, um, you know, a thriving local economy and like what that actually looks like? You know, we were kind of talking about um, the, the taxpayer, um, the like taxpayer rhetoric that comes up in terms of like who is the actual constituency that government is accountable to and taxpayers kind of get stood in as like, oh, we're kind of like taxpayers fund the government. So that means they get it back. Right. And that's kind of coded as like wealthy white people. Um, but similarly, right, and this is relevant for Bank of North Dakota, like, who are the people who really benefit from the loans that the bank gets is small business owners and homeowners, right, which are also coded as like wealthy white people. <laughs> so it's not, this isn't immune from that, right? This is within that context, totally. And we should recognize that and use, but use the example, like where it's helpful. Um, and it is like, you know, a success story. There's a lot of good example, like data that we can draw from it for example, around the 1997 floods that were happening, um, I and mean, also COVID, but like the 97 floods, they were, the bank was able to give a zero interest or like a near zero interest line of credit to, um, I forget the name of the city, um, but they gave a near zero interest line of credit to the city because there was a state of emergency going on. So rather than being in a situation where we have to like borrow like crazy from Wall Street or like we're we're doing austerity because like we're cash strapped now because we have this natural disaster going on. They're like, no, actually we have financial infrastructure to make sure all of our needs are met and like our, our public services are able to be supported when they need to be supported. Um, similarly with COVID, um, it's a little bit different just in terms of like the distribution of the, the payroll protection program, right? This is like an interesting way that 
because our whole finance system is privatized like down to the local level. Um, we had distributed money to people through their employers and then they got it through banks. So it's kind of crazy, like the, the chain that had to, to actually reach people um, to make to like who are employed or who want to stay on the payroll. Um, but, um, you know, th there was infrastructure there. Like they already was relationships in North Dakota from like um, the federal government to the Bank of North Dakota to the businesses. Like they have a much more developed community uh, banking ecosystem there. And like they're, it's much more direct. And that's why they're able to get more PPP loans per capita um, than any other state in the country, which is a good thing. And like, we should celebrate that. And we should point to that as a victory for public banks. Um, but it's, it's uneven. It's not, it's not all just kind of like, um, you know, we love North Dakota. Like there are, it's also, <laughs> that's where also the Standing Rock, um, you know, they, the Bank of North Dakota, sorry, I'm going on on this, but the Bank of North Dakota um, gave a $10 million line of credit to the, the state police, like as they were repressing um, the Standing Rock activists. And um, so like the, um, you know, <laughs> at the same time that it was inspiring public banks in California, it was also actively facilitating police repression against, um, you know, the water protectors. So it's, it's important to see both sides of that can be used for good and evil, right on. Well, I'm just gonna uh, state a goal of finishing our slides in, in between five and 10 minutes because we wanna leave time for, for discussion. Um, but yeah, this is really appreciate uh, all the context, Michael. Um, all right, so uh, I guess, Mike Lewis, would you describe, this seems like just different folks who are, are, are in the public banking movement? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think Michael already touched on some of the places where there's other campaigns and how they're they're playing out in different ways and there's complexities to each kind of, you know, regional uh, uh, campaign and situation. Um, you know, uh, some of them are going after like the state level law to create, um, you know, the ability to create uh, a state level bank. Some of them are like California created, uh, you know, this uh, AB is 857. Do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that, that created the ability to, for California to create like 10 city level, uh, municipal level public banks. Um, so yeah, maybe Michael, you can talk a little bit about, uh, New Mexico is another example uh, locally, uh, right, right, right next door where they're also pushing for, for public banking. So yeah, it's not just the coast. And I wasn't chastising you, Michael, uh, you, you've been great. Um, but, uh, um, I think you got it, Mike, I'm good. Okay, cool. Um, right on. Um, so here's a little compare and contrast of uh, three established public banks. Um, uh, Mike Lewis, is this like a slide? I don't know. Is this yeah. worth, worth describing? Yeah, we can kind of breeze through some of these. I think like uh, the one thing to point out is that like, you know, public banking is a kind of, we're, we're kind of an outlier in the US in, in that we have the Bank of North Dakota as Michael's paper um, on the, the governance uh, for, for the public bank of LA points out that there's like over 900 banks uh, in the world. And so, you know, like there's close to $49 trillion in, in public banks. It's close to like 17% of uh, uh, banking um uh, infrastructure around the world is, is public banks. So it's, it's not like um, this is a, something that's completely um, unknown to the rest of the world. We're just, we're outliers for not having it basically here. At one, at one point in time, the biggest financial institution in the world was Japan's Postal Bank. Yeah, now Postal Banking is another cool to topic uh, we should get yeah. into. Um, Right on. Uh, so I guess here's the, the timeline from Philly uh, to the extent that we wanted to model uh, a campaign in Austin around Philly. Um, you want to run this down, Mike Lewis? Yeah, I mean, just so like all it took was some, some basic lobby days, some, some uh, town halls, uh, getting in front of members of council and saying, hey, look, this is something that can be done. Um, and, and it's realistic. Other cities or yeah, other, other cities around the country are doing this. You know, Philly has been on the cutting edge. I'll just give them a shout out on some, some of the other issues they've pushed forward. Like early COVID, they did an, a unanimous resolution calling on the Fed to uh, basically allow for zero interest loans uh, and lines of credit to cities. Um, you know, they create, the Fed created the municipal liquidity facilities at the beginning of COVID. Um, unfortunately, it was a policy choice to have it run by the, the person who ran Promisa, which was the, you know, predatory, uh, 
uh, governance institution over Puerto Rico. Um, and, and like, you know, they, they, they offered extremely, um, you know, non-competitive rates to cities. It was like, it was completely, um, not, not even worth it for cities to, to try to refinance with these facilities that the Fed created. And that was a policy choice. Um, they could have been different. And so I think like, you know, just pointing out that Philly has, has done some really good stuff, um, in terms of, you know, uh, pushing, pushing the envelope on progressive public finance around the country. And then uh, our, our final slide before we'll, we'll open discussion, uh, how is a, a public bank paid for? I'll let Michael take this one. Um, yeah, there's, there's a few ways you can do it. Um, and again, all of them have kind of political trade-offs depending on how you want to approach it. Um, Something I'm favorable to that's, that's mentioned here is using rainy day funds. Um, so the example I was giving for um, the Bank of North Dakota with the floods that happened in 1997 are a really good example of how a public bank can essentially stand in for the function of a rainy day fund, right? A rainy day fund just sits there and if there is a state of emergency, like you can tap into it. But even with COVID, right, like we didn't really end up using our rainy day funds because there was money from the federal government. It got replenished. And now our, a lot of rainy day funds are bigger than they were before COVID. And so it's kind of, it's, it's not, the, it doesn't fulfill the function that people kind of ideologically might be like, we can never touch this rainy day fund. Um, and so you can just use it. I mean, I would, this is kind of like a, I, I'd be willing to stake out this, this line for any public bank movement that using rainy day funds is probably the best uh, approach because it would you can set into the charter of the bank or the bylaws of the bank that in a in a you know a state state of emergency declared on the state level or the federal level um, the bank can give zero percent interest lines of credit to the city for proper purposes um, and so that on an as needed basis it can just create money to um, deal with the issue and then it, it would have to get paid back. Um, but it's on the city's on the city's balance sheet, so it you know, it's there's no collector that's going to come for itself, right? So it's it's okay. Um, but otherwise, um, the city can uh, issue, or I guess one last thing to mention with that is from the money that the federal government was giving to um, state and local governments through COVID aid, right? The American Rescue Plan that passed after Biden got elected. Um, it's uh, like or I guess I said this, but like the, that pot of money um, is, um, it, it was something that public bank movements were focused on and trying to like react to and be able to use it, especially in California as where they wanted to capitalize the public banks from. Um, and it's something that really should be re-socialized as, hey, there was this like federal injection of money that um, really went to like police and like went to like the bad things we don't want it to go to. And so having this as an option for where the money should go to instead is, is important to, to point out. Luckily here in Austin, uh, progressive council members got it towards housing and other support. Right. But yeah, okay. Houston burned it on cops and most people did. Yeah. Um, second option listed here is um, issuing a bond to capitalize the public bank. This is what the Bank of North Dakota did. Um, and the bank can then buy the bond and issue the city corresponding deposits. Um, it's, um, you know, I think this is technically feasible and like it's something you could push. And like, um, if you can properly like educate council members on, like I'd be open to this line. I'm a little bit more skeptical just on the, <laughs> of, like, it would be hard to like convince the city to borrow this amount of money and then buy it back to itself and like try to like convince people around the, <laughs> the mechanics of this. I think it would be kind of confusing for people. Um, so politically, I see it as a little bit difficult and like as much as possible, I think like trying to lean into like the movement politics of this and like building power um, versus trying to rely on kind of like technical things that will work. Like I think that this the second option would like technically be something that we could do, but like um, it would have to be alongside like building um, power to be able to like get people on board with this as something um, so sorry, sorry to yeah, be, be critical from the thing we have presented, but like that's, oh, yeah, no. that's my thought on that option anyway. But now we wouldn't be proper socialists if we weren't critical of ourselves. Yeah. 
Um, uh, so really appreciate Michael, Brennan, uh, Mike Lewis, thank y'all for, for joining us. And uh, with that, Heather, um, we'd like to pass it back to you uh, to facilitate the discussion. Thanks so much.